Hi, everyone. Welcome to Being Patient Brain Talks. I'm Deborah Khan, founder of Being Patient. Today, we're going to talk about whether an eye test can determine and detect um, Alzheimer's disease at a very early stage. Joining me now is uh, Dr. Peter Snyder. He is with the University of Rhode Island and has just launched a study uh, that they are now recruiting for to determine whether or not retinal scans can detect and pick up on Alzheimer's. Thanks very much, Peter, for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So, you know, I. Uh, be, prior to reading about this research, you know, I had heard about people going to an optician and getting an eye exam, and actually the optician was the person who picked up on things like a brain tumor. But when we're talking about neurodegenerative disease, what exactly are you looking for when you're looking through the eyes? Well, just to step back for a moment, what we're really interested in is not the entire structure of the eye, but the retina, because the retina is an extension of the brain. It is literally part of our central nervous system. It contains the same neurons, the same glial cells, the same vascular supply, the same chemistry as our brains do. And in fact, the cells that form the retina migrate off of the same cluster of cells that form the brain early in embryologic development. So we're looking at the same tissue, but the really exciting thing about looking at the retina for clues to whether someone may have a brain disease like Alzheimer's disease is because it's exposed tissue and we can look at it with microscopic detail without causing any harm, without causing any discomfort, um, and without being invasive, without any invasive procedures. So it's a rare opportunity to look at actual nervous system tissue, the same as the brain tissue, for clues to the disease at a potential cost that's much, much lower than brain scans, uh, like PET imaging, uh, which is many, many, many times the cost of, of retinal imaging. And um, in a way where people just as part of their normal daily lives on occasion would go in for uh, screenings uh, when you go for eyeglass tests, for instance. Uh, most of us, uh, you and I are both wearing glasses because we're now at a certain age where we develop uh, a very common condition that anyone of our age and older has, which is presbyopia. And we need to have corrective lenses, whether it's eyeglasses or contact lenses. So we go to our optometrist or an ophthalmologist on a re reasonably regular basis, every one or two or three years. and. My hope is that these, these contacts with an optometrist or an ophthalmologist could be the point of contact where we can screen many, many, many people at a population level that's affordable uh, to screen for risk of the disease. So we're looking at the retina as brain tissue that we can see, and we are looking at a number of different parameters, and we're not sure yet what the right measure actually is we can look at the structure of the brain of the, of the tissue we can look at cell populations we can look at the vasculature we can look at the chemistry we can look at the physiology how it functions and the marker that's appropriate for what we want to look at in the retina to diagnose or track the disease screen for the disease or track it um, may be different depending on the stage of the disease that we're interested in. Right. So, well, I, I just going to stop you um, there for a second, just to back up a little bit. When we talked, um, when we talk about PET scans um, or spinal taps to detect Alzheimer's, we're looking for um, evidence of beta amyloid plaque or tau tangles, right? We're, we're, they're looking in the spinal fluid for evidence of that yeah. um, through a scan would it be possible to visibly see something like a beta amyloid plaque? Yes, uh, we, we believe so. But we're not sure that that's necessarily going to be the best metric. Um, and again, it may depend on the stage of the disease. So we're at an early stage here where, um, and this happens with every kind of imaging, the technology is advancing very rapidly and we can get beautiful images. And we have to play catch up now to figure out 
what do they mean? What, what we, we have beautiful, beautiful images that we have to interpret reliably and we have to understand what the best quantitative metrics are that we can cull from those images so that we know when we see a signal that we can rely on it, that it makes sense, that it's repeatable, that it's sensitive enough. Um, and again, this may change over the stage of the disease that we're talking about. So um, why is it, though, Peter, that you would even think of the eye as a door or a window into um, our brain? What what is it about the retina that um, made you evaluate or science evaluate? Um, I know there's several people working on this um, as to that would be a good place for early detection. Well, again, because um, some of these systems that, that seem to be going awry early in uh, the brain in Alzheimer's disease, such as changes in the cholinergic system, which is a neurotransmitter system, it's a chemical system that signals between neurons, and it, 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 we know that it's affected very early in the disease. We can, I, We know where that same system is in the retina. We can see it. We know what layer of cells that, that that chemistry is most active in. And in fact, we have found in my lab early changes in that very specific layer in preclinical Alzheimer's disease in a past study, which actually led to us starting this new trial because it was so, so exciting. What were those changes exactly? I mean, I know you can't drill down to say what's going to detect Alzheimer's early, but what, what were those changes that you were seeing? So a couple of things. First, we found in that one layer that uh, uses that chemical transmitter the most in the, in the retina, we found in the preclinical stage of the disease, that means early before clinical onset of symptoms, possibly by a decade or more, uh, we found evidence of um, increased uh, volume of that structure, which we think represents uh, an inflammatory process. And we know that inf inflammation in the brain is a key, key component of the Alzheimer's disease um, uh, pathophysiology. So, so we're finding some evidence of that in the retina. We also found some what we're calling inclusion bodies because we don't know what else to call them yet. We think that these are uh, blotches of tissue that contain beta amyloid protein that's aggregating right around that same layer and interfering with the transmission of light from the scanner that we're using. And so we need to follow up on that as well. So it may be several things that we're looking at. Okay, and then we just had um, a viewer who, who made a comment. I, I think it's a good comment. He said, um, I had a clinical trial done and they found high levels of tau in my blood above normal people, but being clinical, they couldn't tell me what that really means. Um, so I guess what I'm, what, what, what is a good point is if, if you do um, identify what the changes are, what level of information can you give to the person um, who, who, you know, the patient who might have these changes? I mean, does this conclusively mean you're on the road to Alzheimer's? Is it, is it a way to detect MCI, an earlier stage of Alzheimer's? Um, what do you think specifically um, we may be potentially able to get out of these type of tests? Yeah, so that's a wonderful question. And, and I, I wanna be clear about this. What I think we're developing is a screening test to know when people who are older adults in our community need to be referred to a specialty center for more invasive and expensive diagnostic confirmatory tests. A screening test is not the same as making a confirmatory diagnosis. Um, it, we allow a little bit of false positive error in these mm -hmm. tests because we'd rather catch more people who we are worried about than not find individuals who may go on to have the disease that we don't detect and we don't see any evidence of it. So a screening test may identify persons at risk who the optometrist one day will say, 
I've been following you for several years. I'm seeing some changes in your retina that indicate to me that I'd like to refer you to a neurologist or to a memory disorder center in order to get a, 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 more, a, a next round of testing. That would be a success because right now we don't have anything that does that. And I believe that we're not going to be able to slow progression of the disease. We're not going to be able to develop a therapy that really um, is effective unless we intervene earlier than we are or have or earlier than we've attempted so far. So we learned um, in recent years through scanning studies that beta amyloid can be detected in the brain decades before you actually see a symptom of Alzheimer's disease. Would a screening, um, when you talk about the screening though, you're more talking about um, perhaps, I mean, I think one of the fears among the patient community, we've talked to um, as people in our patient community and people who have been diagnosed, particularly with early onset Alzheimer's, um, when you talk about early detection, it kind of scares them in the sense that they don't really, like they, um, one person had pointed out to me, what if I was diagnosed in my early 50s? What if someone told me in my 20s that I was going to get Alzheimer's disease? What, what would have that done to my life? You know, that's not necessarily a positive from the patient's perspective. But the way that you're talking about this is more, um, not to forecast the future, like maybe a blood test could pick up earlier, but more as a scan, as something's going wrong, let's, let's, you know, let's send you to the next person. Is that right? Yes, but we do want to pick it up early. We want to pick it up. I'd like to pick it up a decade or two decades early. And the reason is, is that right now we've been, we've spent decades trying to develop therapies that reverse damage that's already been done right? Once someone is clinically showing symptoms, this disease has been present for up to decades. And to try to undo damage rather than prevent it from progressing, I think we are asking too much of therapeutics that, uh, you know, these drugs will only do so much. We can't go back and reverse time in that, that has caused damage to our, to our brains. Yeah. So I do think we need to intervene early. We have to identify high risk. And yeah, you're right. It's a, it's a chicken and egg problem. Uh, but ultimately, my goal is to protect quality of life. It's so much easier to protect it than to try to reverse time and go back. Someone has asked, um, uh, an audience member has asked, how early can people actually get tested? Well, right now we are enrolling individuals who are 55 and older. Um, you know, we are not looking at um, unusual uh, genetic uh, predispositions for the disease for early onset. Uh, like the autosomal dominant variants of the disease. We're really looking at late onset disease, at least to start. That doesn't mean it won't be applicable for earlier forms of the disease, but we're just not, we're not there yet. Um, we, um, you know, we, I, I believe that eventually I'd like to see this rolled out so that anyone who is kind of in their mid forties, early forties, who start to need these and uh, will be going to an optometrist on a regular basis, that would be the time to get a nice baseline and start tracking someone so that as we see some very subtle changes, none of this is dramatic. We're looking for very tiny microscopic changes in the retina. And, and the better, the stronger of a baseline, more reliable of a baseline that we have for each person, the more likely we're gonna identify subtle changes early on. And, and I, I am totally, I agree with the feeling that, you know, it, it can be very disconcerting to know that you're at high risk when there isn't a therapeutic available. Unfortunately, we are at a point where we have to do something to identify high risk persons early, or we're not going to develop a therapeutic that is effective. Someone just commented about CTE. Um, it, would this be detectable, this type of um, screening for, for CTE? It is possible. Um, so the, the uh, and this gets back to why it's a screening test and not a confirmatory diagnosis. Some of the changes we are looking at in the retina may not be specific solely to Alzheimer's disease. They may reflect neurodegeneration, which could be an underlying uh, signal for a, a host of neurodegenerative conditions. So that's why when we see this kind of change, 
we would refer on to a specialist. That would be the purpose of a screening test. And there's a good analogy, by the way, in optometry and ophthalmology. Um, optometrists are now one of the principal clinicians that identify persons who are in the early diabetic stage for, for diabetes before anyone else. But they don't treat the diabetes. They don't confirm the diagnosis of the diabetes. They see evidence in the retina, and they refer on to, to either the internist or, or diabetologist. Uh, and, and that's what we would see. We're, we're actually looking at a direct analogy to that. Well, it's, it certainly proves the saying, when um, your eyes are the windows into, into you, you know, your, your inner self. That's that. Um, Obviously, there are a lot of clues um, through through looking um, through your eyes. Um, I wanted to touch a little bit about how you're going about these trials. Um, you, I, I believe, right now they're in two states, Florida and Rhode Island. Is right. is that correct? Yeah. So, yeah. what is it? What is it like from the person who's participating? Um, what what type of tests do they have to go through and you know what um how long will it take you before you actually have conclusive um evidence that this type of early detection works mm -hmm. um so we we uh from our last study that we finished which was a five-year trial we have some very exciting um evidence that we, we we're on the right path we really believe this so this next trial is to confirm it and to narrow down the range of metrics to identify the one, two, or three ways of scoring the retinal imaging that we can then translate into a test that we can roll out broadly to, to optometry and ophthalmology practices. That's going to take about a five-year study. We are enrolling uh, several hundred people that we're going to follow for for uh, three years each. So we're enrolling for the next two years, and then we're going to follow everybody for three years after that. Um, we're doing a awfully a, a, a range of tests before the retinal imaging. I'll get to that. We're doing blood testing to under to look at uh, uh, amyloid protein and tau and other proteins in the blood. We are doing brain imaging when we can for as many people as we can. We are doing genetic testing, cognitive assessment, and we're doing this every year so for five years. We're doing it every year for, for everybody. The are these people who are pre-symptomatic or not? Most of them are. So most of them, most of them are. The, the vast with three quarters of the sample will be pre-symptomatic, but we are gonna look at some, uh, what we call super healthy aging persons who have no risk, no genetic risk, no family history, no complaints. We're going to look at some people with MCI, and we're going to look at a group with mild AD. So we're going to look at the whole spectrum, and we're going to follow all of these people for five years, and we're going to do very comprehensive assessments each year. And the retinal imaging will include anatomic imaging, looking for uh, using a special laser that we think will pick up on amyloid inclusion in the retina, looking at the blood vessels, blood vessels that are so thin that they're half the width of a human hair. Uh, we are looking at um, the chemistry in the retina. So we're looking at a lot of different imaging modalities, different ways of imaging the retina, because it's a really complex system. And the signal that we care about the most may change over the course of the disease, and we don't know that yet. So we're really looking at it as a complex system. And I think three or four years from now, we'll be hot on the path to finding the, the metric or two that, that, that is most important and, and that will develop into a, a useful tool. So we just had a, a viewer say, I'm in Florida, sign me up. So we just got you another participant. <laughs> uh, if, you're, if you're in the Tampa area, um, then it's the BayCare Health System. And it's either the Morton Plant Hospital or St. Anthony's Hospital in the Tampa area. We'll post this um, on beingpatient.com um, once we finish this interview. And we obviously upload all these interviews, so we'll provide the information. Um, we have another comment coming in um, from a woman saying, at my husband's, um, he was diagnosed, her husband was diagnosed with Alzheimer's five years ago. And as at his um, last optometrist appointment, his doctor looked long and hard at his retinas. He reported seeing something he will be tracking. And now that she's listening to our interview, she's wondering 
and curious if there's a connection. Are doctors, do doctors know this today? Are there some doctors out there who are actually noticing changes? Um, have you heard of things like that? Oh, Liz, we've been, so yes. Um, first of all, I'm not the only investigator that's looking at this. I, my group is unique in that we're really focusing on the preclinical stage of the disease, but we're by, by no means the only group looking at this. And there is an increasing number of publications on this topic. And I have given many, many talks to optometry and ophthalmology groups all over the world who are really excited about this because they see this as a potential important tool to provide additional services to their patients. So the ophthalmology and the optometry communities are sensitive to this and they're excited about it. So it, that doesn't surprise me that, 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 um, that, that her uh, husband's doctor is looking pretty carefully at the retina, yeah. What about how much information do you give back to the trial participants? Um, you know, you're tracking a lot of different things. Um, are they able to get that information or is that something that you don't get feedback to the, to the person, the participant? Well, remember that we don't yet know what the precise metrics are. So if we don't know what they are, it's really hard to use them clinically. Uh, this is pathfinding research, and it has to be done. We were, this is the stage we're at, but I'm really excited about the potential. What we do do is we are following our participants for five years at least, and we'll see where this goes after that. But um, if we notice any decline, and it may not just be decline in the retina, with retinal imaging, it could be cognitive decline, uh, we will refer for proper care because that, that is morally and ethically the right thing to do. Uh, and we will let the patient know when we need to refer them for, for proper care uh, or for follow-up assessment. Um, but, but we're not ready to use this information clinically just yet. Okay, and someone has just asked, um, I think you mentioned the age, but are younger adults aged 45 and above um, accepted into to this study? Not into this study right now, um, but uh, no, it, it's 55 is the youngest age. But, but uh, you know, I do think once this go, rolls out into more broad clinical use, um, we will probably, you know, optometrists will start screening their uh, patients in their practices at, in the in their mid 40s you know, when people are in their mid 40s again the longer the baseline and the more stable the baseline the more sensitive will be sensitively will be able to detect early changes in the retina for an individual person Peter, what would this mean um, if, I mean, it sounds like you're, you're on track um, for, to get more specific data, but in principle, um, it's logical to believe that something like this would work. What, what would that mean for research if you could detect, and, and where do you see, I mean, we're, we're talking about this in the context of people who maybe have signs of um, cognitive impairment, um, but could this possibly be used in a healthy person uh, in their 30s and to, to, to understand if there are cognitive changes that early? Um, I, I don't know yet. I'm not sure how early in the lifespan we can push uh, identifying retinal changes in, in what would otherwise be very, very healthy eyes. Uh, we're looking for very small, tiny changes in the structure and function of the retina. And I, I don't think we know um, where we'll have a, a drop off and we just won't be able to detect any anything earlier than a certain age. Um, you know, part so what of what I mean, what, okay, so let's say you can use it as a pre-screening tool. Um, what, what does that mean for the trajectory of research? Oh, I, I think it'll mean an awful lot. Um, you know, we have, as I said before, we have had a, a graveyard of failed trials, uh, clinical trials, and and there's all sorts of potential reasons for this: uh, the wrong target, the compound didn't do what we thought it would do, the wrong measures. Um, but part of it is the wrong uh, or not optimal selection of participants in our trials. If we are trying to intervene too late, again, we may not, we may be hoping for a drug to have an effect that it just won't have. It may be easier to slow the disease down before it's caused so much trauma to the brain. So we need to enroll people in clinical trials earlier 
But if we do that, we need to be really pretty sure that they're at very high risk and are actually on the path to getting the disease. Otherwise, the trial will fail for a whole host of new reasons. So, so <clears throat> I think early screening that is reliable um, is something that we absolutely have to have in order to develop um, therapeutics that, that stand a hope of really slowing this down. Okay, and um, if people want to find out more about these trials, um, where should they go? Do you have a dedicated website? We don't yet. Um, we um, certainly we, we can be found through uh, clinicaltrials.gov, uh, which is uh, uh, FDA uh, um, run website. Um, I believe we're identifiable through the Alzheimer's Association's uh, search engine for clinical trials. Uh, and uh, again, in Florida, it would be the Baycare hospital system. Okay, Peter, thank you so much. Um, we will, of course, as we do all of our interviews, repost this on beingpatient.com. We'll give you links um, to places where you can find out about trials like these. We so appreciate your time and please do keep us abreast of this research. I know it's really interesting to a lot of people in our community um, and we'd love to hear how the study goes. I'd be happy to. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. So to our viewers, um, for more interviews like these, you could go to beingpatient.com brain talks. Um, that's where we host um, a, a wide array of topics on both brain health and Alzheimer's disease. Thanks very much for watching and we'll see you next time.